This here is my project Audi TT, and right now we are in the middle of completely refreshing the suspension. I'm in the middle of a quest to make this 20 plus year old vehicle handle like it came out yesterday. I want to set the stage. This car handles good, but I want it to be even better. The car currently sits with an adjustable rear sway bar and, as of last episode, an adjustable pair of rear control arms. If you missed that, you might be wondering why we're even doing all this. Why not just throw on coilovers? Well, that's actually the main goal, but I want to be able to fully utilize the coilovers we throw on the car, and that means being able to optimize the tow, camber, and caster for each one of these wheels. In other words, the name of the game is adjustability, and that means we want adjustable control arms front and rear as well as the adjustable sway bar and of course once all these parts are in the car we're gonna get the car professionally suspension tuned last week we did the rear and this week we're doing the front front suspensions are marginally more complicated than the rear suspension but today the part we're replacing is super simple The two small yellow boxes are ball joints if you haven't guessed it already. If you don't know what these are, these are the actual part that connects the wheel or the spindle to the control arm we're replacing. The front wheels have to worry about rotating, hence why we have a ball joint in the front and not in the rear. As far as adjustable control arms in the front are concerned, I splurged a little bit and I'm gonna geek out over what I bought, but I hope you think it's as cool as I do. There are some really cool small business automotive companies that make some insanely awesome aftermarket parts. It's an unfortunate reality that when you're looking for aftermarket parts, small businesses sometimes get overlooked. I think for any purchase, it's always important to weigh the value of quality and brand recognition. From what I've observed, that's not always something that's at the top of people's minds when it comes to car parts. These control arms are a perfect example of just how good some small companies can be. The craftsmanship and honestly artistry that goes behind designing and making parts like this, which you'll see in a second, is honestly insane. Large companies like ECS make their own version of this part, but honestly, I don't know if they can really live up to this kind of bespoke quality. This is an adjustable tubular control arm kit from a company called Eurologic. These guys specialize in aftermarket tubular suspension, and this is designed specifically for the 225. I first stumbled upon this company's website when I was searching online for suspension mods, and I'm blown away with their quality. These are all made to order, so it's kind of cool to know that when I bought this, it was literally fabricated specifically for my car. By now, if you've stuck around my channel for a while, you kind of know the drill for control arms. The first thing we need to do is get this side up on jack stands.
This three-pronged piece of metal is what we're going to be replacing, and it's our control arm. This front one has two connections to the subframe and one to the ball joint down here. This crack in the bushing here is literally what inspired me to redo the whole suspension, which I think is kind of funny. There's absolutely no trickery in this install. There's literally only three bolts to worry about. I learned this and I thought it was cool. German suspension bushings are designed to be biodegradable, so these don't always fail because of overuse. Sometimes they literally just fall apart from old age and that's by design. If you plan to own a German car for any amount of time longer than a few years, you're probably going to have to replace a few of these. Even when you have these bolts loose, sometimes they take a little bit of effort to come out, so I usually just work them out with a screwdriver or a pry bar. So long as you don't put a bunch of pressure on the threads themselves, the bolts will stay intact. There is a weird rumor on some threads online saying that you need to remove the subframe to actually remove this control arm. I disagree. The nut that's on the end of this bolt over here is the one they're talking about, and you can slip a wrench in through the top into the hole or the abyss if you will. Since the bolt comes out through the bottom, you're totally fine. When the bolts finally come out, you're good to drop the control arm through the bottom of the car. The stock control arm is actually a lot heavier than it looks. That's another benefit of tubular suspension. It is seriously light. If your ball joint's in good condition, you could technically reuse it, but I didn't want to really risk it, so I decided to just order a new one. Initially, I used the same technique I did on the rear where I assembled the control arm and tried to get it to line up identically to the one that came out of the car. I'm not going to align the car until after I get the rest of the suspension built, so it makes sense to try to get it as close to factory spec as possible. This was initially a good idea, but you'll see that it doesn't actually work for this control arm specifically. Sometimes with aftermarket parts you have to install, remove, and reinstall before it's actually fitting the way that you want it to. This was one of those cases. Turns out that this control arm has an additional amount of caster built into it. Of course this is intentional and it really just adds more adjustability. Not knowing this, I installed it the first time at the factory length and you'll see what ends up happening. I got the control arm installed at factory length, and then I ended up realizing that the spindle wasn't centered. The wheel was actually situated a lot closer to the rear of the wheel well than the front of the wheel well, so I went back to the drawing board and readjusted. Since there was more caster built into the control arm, I found I actually had to lengthen it a little bit more than stock to get it to sit neutrally in the wheel well. Obviously, this isn't going to be perfectly aligned, so I don't plan on driving this car a ton until we get the rest of the suspension installed and get a proper alignment. This is just going to be close enough to get us to be able to move it if we have to. Another thing to note is just like any other control arm, I'm waiting to torque this down until the car's at ride height on ramps. We'll get a better look at this later, but I really like how the tubular suspension looks so far. While I was down here, I figured it would be a good idea to get measurements for both sides so that I could mimic those on the other side of the car. This is because I can't use the length of the factory control arms to gauge my measurements, so I wanted to make sure that the measurements were at least equal. Side seems to be sitting good. Should be good to move on to the other side now. It's going a lot faster than the rear control arms. Since I work outside, I really like to do the warmest side first so that I kind of have a reward working in the shade afterwards. I don't know if that's just me or not, but it works.
Other than the addition of a headlight leveling sensor, this side is identical to the other side of the car. This is a similar sensor to the one that we installed on the rear control arm, so it really is just as simple as unbolting it and then bolting it onto the new control arm. This week's install went, honestly, a little too smooth, and it has me nervous. I don't know if it's just me, or if this is a universal thing, but whenever I have a really easy week, or things are going just a little bit too smooth, something happens and throws a wrench in my plans. I don't think this is always intrinsically bad, though. Sometimes change and having to roll with the punches just makes you grow a lot as a person. Maybe it's actually just progress. Maybe spending all this time working on cars is actually teaching me something, and I'm getting better at these jobs. Or maybe I'm just reading into this too much and seeing patterns where there aren't any. Either way, the parts fit great and the install went smoothly, so I'm happy. So let's just keep our fingers crossed and hope next week goes just as well. Once the wheel was back on and the control arm was loosely tightened down, it was time to get the car on ramps. It kind of goes without saying that to do that, we need to get the car off jack stands and torque down the wheels. Went ahead and torqued all the bolts since the car is on ramps. Should be good to go and test drive the car. The alignment is not perfect, so we're gonna get coilovers on soon and then get the car actually suspension tuned. Should be fun. I can't stress enough just how gorgeous these parts are. I can't wait to see what it looks like with all the other new parts that I have to put on. Now I think it's time we take the car on a little bit of a test drive to see if we notice a difference though. Believe it or not, but front control arm upgrades on a TT actually dramatically change how the car feels, and that all has to do with this car's past. This car's got an interesting history, and when it first came out, it really struggled with liftoff oversteer. The car actually had pretty much an entirely different suspension when it first came out. The car was recalled because it was geared towards a more skilled driver. Doing this, they effectively nerfed the handling from the factory. From what I've researched, they made it a lot softer to drive and biased it towards understeer, removing how it used to handle more like a sports car. Some of the changes included adding a rear wing, modifying the rear sway bar to be a little bit softer, and completely redesigning the front control arms to bias understeer. This was all done to make the car safer and more predictable for the average driver. Understeer is not inherently safer, it's just easier to control when you're inexperienced. If you look at the old school control arms versus the current control arms, you can notice that there's a huge difference in the amount of bushings they have. That increase in bushings not only causes understeer, but reduces road feel and kind of makes the car feel more muted. The aftermarket suspension I just put on replaces bushings with heim joints which are pretty much all metal, making it feel sharper like the old style suspension. This is exactly what I wanted and it's going to make the car a lot more fun to drive. Car drives great, turn in is considerably more immediate. My one complaint before was that I felt like you would turn the wheel and there'd be some sort of a small delay before the car actually dove into the corner. It would dive just fine, but there was a little bit of latency between your actual movement and turning into a corner. This definitely fixes that. I also think it dramatically improves road feel through the steering wheel. Like, it's comical how much more you can feel. The side effect of that, definitely a little bit more bumpy and noisy in the cabin, especially on not perfect roads. Overall, definitely worth it since we're going to be dropping the car here in a week or so. In my opinion, even without the proper tuning, this car feels a lot better. It is so much more raw and your inputs are directly translated into immediate turn -in. It's kind of addicting. It's also really cool to find finally start feeling the results from actually putting this much effort into upgrading the suspension. We've still got a long ways to go though. I want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your day to watch my video. It means a lot to me and the support you guys give me is absolutely insane. I'm going to have project cars my entire life and I'm going to be documenting them all here. So if that sounds interesting or you liked and learned something from this video, consider dropping a like and subscribing for more. I can't thank you enough for the amount of support I've been getting on both of these projects. Anyways, thank you again for watching. Have a wonderful day.